Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 3rd, 2019, and before introducing today's guest, I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org, econtalk.org where you'll find a link to the survey where you can tell me your favorite episodes of last year. The survey closes on February 2nd, and I'll be announcing results toward the end of February. And now for today's guest. My guest is economist and author Dan Klein of George Mason University. This is Dan's 10th appearance on Acon Talk, and to my surprise his, and disappointment, uh, his first since December 2011. Eight years ago, included in those nine previous experiences, is a six-part conversation we had about Adam Smith's masterpiece, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which taught me a great deal about that book and about Adam Smith, and eventually inspired me to write my book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life. Dan, it's been a long time, too long. Welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks very much. Our topic for today is a recent essay you've written for Economic Affairs. The title is, Is It Just to Pursue Honest Income? which will inevitably lead us back to Adam Smith, but I'm sure to other places as well. Uh, At the heart of your essay is a fundamental question. Does our work, that which we do in exchange for money, does that make the world a better place? Is that a a good starting place, Dan, for our conversation? Sure. Is it a way to advance the good of the whole, universal benevolence, you know, social well-being? Um, Those are all the moral responsibility that we all have, believe it or not. That's uh, Adam Smith's call, is that we are always under this obligation to advance the good of the whole. It sounds very oppressive, (laughs) but of course we have to think about what constitutes the good of the whole and what part our own well-being plays or occupies in that good of the whole, which then can make it less oppressive because it can then justify our own well-being as part of the whole. And so, yeah, the idea that doing work and getting honest income advances the good of the whole is, I think, one of Adam Smith's important, very important teachings. I would go so far as to say that his two major moral authorizations are that the pursuit of honest income is morally, presumptively just in this broad sense of the term, broader sense of the term justice. So a kind of moral authorization of the pursuit of honest income, and then the moral authorization of a presumption of liberty in policy and politics. And with those two presumptions that came forward, especially more completely than in the wealth of nations and into the last part of his life, thereafter, what do we get? Bang, the great enrichment. Yeah, I, I, I'm a skeptic on that, but let's um, we'll stick to the skeptic on the idea that that those ideas that that moral authorization that you're talking about of those two kinds that they um, created the that that big bang of prosperity, uh, an idea I associate with Deirdre McCloskey, and she she defends it uh, ably and thoughtfully, but uh, that. Let's put that to the side for now. Let's start with just this question of, of honest income. Mm-hmm. Maybe you should just define what you mean by honest income or what Smith meant by it. Yes, indeed. The major feature of honest income is that you make money within the bounds of commutative justice, which is the more grammar-like, not messing with other people's person, property, and promises do not messing with their stuff. That's commutative justice. And as long as you're not messing with other people's stuff, that's got a presumptive moral legitimacy. So that would be the major feature of the honest part of honest income. I would extend it beyond that. I would say that it includes also not misleading people, not jerking people around. And I I feel I have to add that because I don't feel that every case of misleading people or jerking people around constitutes a violation of commutative justice. 
Like you can misleadingly advertise things and jerk people around in other ways, which aren't, strictly speaking, a violation of commutative justice. But I would say don't make honest income or don't make, you know, honesty. And I would also add that despite being a government employee myself, working that, for George Mason University, working for George Mason, um, I would I would cleave away for present purposes income you get income augmentation involving the government, whether like you're like me selling your services in employment to uh, the government or selling, you know, missile defense systems or, I don't know, sweetheart, grafty contracts or whatever they may be. They may be perfectly great and wonderful, but it doesn't carry the same presumption in my view. And so when I speak of honest income, I'd like to kind of put that aside as well. So basically private enterprise, not jerking people around, certainly not messing with their stuff. No fraud. Um, yeah. No deliberate misrepresentation of the quality of a product and, and so on. Yes. So that's um, commutative justice is, I always think of it as um, don't hurt other people. It, it includes not st- stealing their stuff, not hurting their person. I think you included that in, in the in the yes. definition. And then Smith has another type of justice, uh, distributive justice. So talk about what that is. That's the making the becoming use of what is your own. You see, that concerns using your own stuff in a becoming way, as opposed to commutative justice, which is about not messing with other people's stuff. So there's a very major conceptual difference here. Uh, And this becoming use is obviously uh, aesthetic. Its rules are loose, vague, and indeterminate, like aesthetics, um, as opposed to the commutative justice rules, which were precise and accurate, like grammar. Um, and so, yes, distributive justice is distributing your own stuff, making a use of your own stuff in a way that's becoming. And this becomingness corresponds to this idea we started with of serving the good of the whole, serving universal benevolence is another way to put that. Yeah, let's go into that for a bit because it's um, interesting. Uh, economics often pretends not to have much to say about that, and then it turns around. It <laughs> economists turn around and, and pretend they have a lot to say about the goodness of the whole. Uh, there are many different strands in economics uh, along these lines. I reject uh, most of them. I think maybe all, almost all of them. I th- you might also. So let me talk about the two strands that I reject. That I. Th- you might also, and then try to distinguish what what your your vision of the whole is and the goodness of the whole is. So one uh, way economists try to deal with the fact that any particular policy helps some people and hurts others, they use the idea of efficiency. So one measure of, quote, helping the whole that economists often invoke, sometimes just implicitly, is that, well, the pie's bigger, and it's bigger means that the people who are harmed could be compensated for their losses so this is a good policy because it made the pie bigger. Uh, I find that uh, bizarre. Uh, it's a rule that – that there's a, it's a utilitarian rule effectively that I think many human beings in everyday life would reject in, in its – certainly in its precise application. But I think even in policy circles, it should be rejected often. It doesn't mean – you should ignore things that make the pie bigger. I think often those are the right things to do. But justifying on the basis that winners could compensate losers strikes me as – uh, I guess fundamentally immoral, actually. Uh, the second way that economists have tried to cope with this is through the idea of a social welfare function. This idea that there is this way to aggregate the well-being of people in a more subtle or uh, overarching way than just adding up the monetary gains and losses or even the monetized gains and losses that might be psychic. And I find that uh, bizarre and strange, but it is mainstream practice in in would be called public uh, economics or uh, welfare economics. I see your vision uh, as somewhat related to that, but I suspect it's not the same thing. So why don't you talk about whether you agree with me about those two ways that economists aggregate things and then uh, what you think is the right way to think about the good of the whole? Um, Yeah, the way I think about it is that it's not well specified 
at all. Um, just like we don't have well specified a notion of a good movie. And yet we talk all the time about what was a good movie and what is a good movie and what makes a movie good. Um, so literature that specifies some, you know, algorithmic description of a social welfare function is very sort of different than this whole Smithian thing. I don't think it's therefore necessarily useless. I think it kind of depends on the use it is put to. Um, and it could be a useful, you know, example, almost a numerical example that um, illustrates or shed lights on, sheds light on some point. Um, as for the reference to um, something like a bigger pie, let's say GDP. Um, yeah, I think that that the problems and limitations of of focusing on that are a lot like our topic today about honest income, where it's not a true and reliable guide. It, it, it does have um, confounds, exceptions, problems. Um, but then again, I think there that you know, often, at least uh, there's a presumptive value to growing GDP, just like Tyler Cowen likes to teach, um, you know, and like in his book, Stubborn Attachments. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to be against growing the pie bigger or even see it's, it's also comes to a question of focal points. Like, like, you know, you say growing the pie. Well, what do we mean by growing the pie? How do we know if we're growing the pie? What includes growing the pie? And just official GDP measures are one thing that's focal. And, you know, we have to structure our discussion around certain reference, right? That, you know, the things we refer to um, and, and, you know, at least can track and measure and discuss and, you know, what happened this, why to go up, why to go down. Um, and you're right that they're not everything that increases GDP is to the good, but it might usually be the case. And then if it and if there's a set of categories or types of things that go the other way, we understand that and we watch out for that. Yeah, I mean I feel the same way. I just think often we forget about those confounds and the other <laughs> that it sometimes goes right. the other way and uh we mismeasure and I, you know, I, your movie example, I was actually going to use it because I learned it from you some past episode, I think, or in casual conversation, this idea that we don't actually construct an index that says plot on a scale of one to 10. That, well, it was a seven. And then acting was a six. The, the script was really good. I'm going to give that a nine. And then it was it was just the right length. It was, it was a little under two hours. And um, I've always enjoyed a good comedy. So I'm going to give that a, just a bonus point. And then I'm going to weight them. I'm not going to weight them. I'm not going to add it up. I'm going to, because I'm, I like plot more than this. And then the question would be, well, what about Dan? Dan has, might not agree with my scores. And you might put different weights on it. But what I learned from you, and you tell me if this is the way you, you think of it, is that but that's not the way human beings actually think about, quote, good movies or good public policy. Yeah. They, they, they might want to have an index or an algorithm or matrix to turn it into a scalar, a number like a 7.3. I gave it a 7.3. And I'll do that sometimes after a movie. I just saw Knives Out. I gave it a six and a half or a seven. It was very enjoyable. Not a great movie, but I, yeah. you might enjoy it. Um, but I don't think about how I got there. It's just a crude yeah. thing. And it's just a shorthand way of saying I liked it a little bit. Not a little, huge amount, but some. Yeah. And I think that's the way, you know, when you've defended that in the past, I've, my first thought, by the time I heard it was, oh, well, that's not very rigorous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And your answer, I think, what is your answer? Uh, no, it doesn't pretend to be rigorous. Yeah, we have to like face it. up to that <laughs> yeah, and get great. used to it, uh, not pretend to. Look. And you're right. We don't go around, you know, putting numbers like that uh, even way after the movie and we sit down and discuss the movie. Although maybe if we go to IMDb, we actually do come up with a number. But I would add that like we don't even know – we couldn't explain how we came to the number. Like if we actually fill in uh, IMDb for a movie we see, we put in an eight or whatever – and you might put in an eight, and I might put in an eight, and we still might have quite different ideas of what a good movie is and why this scored an eight. Um, so again, yeah, that's sort of the loose, vague, and indeterminate, the good of the whole. And a big part of this moral authorization of honest income is getting us to think about 
what is the good of the whole and how things in our lives figure into that? And can we justify it? Do we accommodate it? Do we allow ourselves these recreations, these ple- pleasures, right? And so on. And as constitutive, constitu- constitutive, sorry, of the good of the whole. And those become like moral choices, not necessarily huge ones, but, um, and by the way, let me just say that the spending of honest income, that's kind of another side of the whole personal matter. Um, and I don't really mean to address that so much. I don't address that in the paper. Um, it's more about the making of the income that I focus on. But the spending of the income that you then make, uh, of course, is, is, is an important question too. Let me just say that, listen, making the income is also a distributive choice. It's also about distributing your abilities, your time, your uh, skills, your attention, uh, and everything else. So there's just everything you do can be viewed as this matter in the lenses of distributive justice. Yeah, and I love the phrase that Smith uses that you <clears throat> emphasize, the becoming use of one's own. It's a very awkward phrase for, a, I think, a non-English speaker and even some English speakers because becoming is – a word that in Smith's day meant something else than it tends to mean now. It still has that meaning now, but it doesn't get used much, which is attractive. Love, Smith would call it lovely, I think. Um, and that would mean praiseworthy, meritorious, uh, benevolent. Um, and and I think the when we talk about the becoming use of one's own, I tend to think of whether I give to charity – how much I give to charity, which charities I give to, uh, how I spend money on my children, uh, how I share my resources with my children, the style with which I do it, not just the, the amount, uh, the incentives I give for them to be independent, to grow, to mature versus to coddle and, and take away responsibility if I'm not careful. And 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 then – but but you're really pointing out it's a richer idea because part of one's own isn't just – your charitable giving, say, or the whether you buy things made in a way that someone might call fair or whatever, but but also your gifts, your skills, your endowment of of nature and nurture that you come into adulthood with. Uh, how should you use those? And Smith would call that a question. You're saying of distributive justice, a particular kind, yeah, but an important kind, which is really going to be our focus today. Yeah, and earning more, like winning more. Bringing home more bacon, like you could. Smith is essentially making a case that that has distributive justice to it. Like there's a strong case for saying that's presumptively distributively just, and that is a becoming use. That it's becoming to bring home more bacon. Yeah, uh, the um, the book of Genesis. You, you should toil for six days and rest on the seventh. Um, uh, it's actually an exodus that that gets talked about, but it's you're supposed to emulate the divine and work for six days. But it's it's not just rest on the seventh. It's work on six day work for six days, meaning transform the world. There's certainly an important part of our Western culture or civilization, uh, whether it comes through religion or not, that that work certainly in Judaism, but also obviously in Protestantism, yeah. work is admirable. Yeah. So I guess it's about working six out of seven days you work, not because you need to work six out of seven days to survive, but that's your duty is Correct. to work six out of seven days. And of course, many of us feel that way. We feel that's part of what drives us is our, is our work, Is if we're lucky. Not everybody feels that way, of course. Um, but I'm blessed, I feel, to do what I love and, and enjoy. Work. Get, I get up in the morning happy and excited to do my job. Uh, and that's somewhat modern phenomena, but not 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 so much, maybe. No, but also part of what I think Smith wants to teach us is: look, let's suppose you have some other job that maybe is not, you know, what you would say just say about your job, but you could still find a lot of satisfaction and pride and virtue in it, and the honest income you earn. Uh, on 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 the understanding that it's helping the good of the whole. Um, and you can, you can make the most of that uh, 
by, both by perhaps raising your income, but also just by enriching your life there and all other sorts of ways that also count to the good of the whole. Uh, so it's also about attitudes towards work. I mean, my paper is more about the ethics of economic activity as a person, as a you know, regular person, uh, and about economic enterprise. It's not the paper is not so much actually about policy and free, you know, advocating free enterprise. It's more like pe like teaching Smiths what gets called commercial humanism by Pocock. Um, Smith's a kind of virtue in the liberal plan that Smith proposed, that Smith advanced. So kind of it not not only is like a, a a policy prescription and presumption, which it certainly is, and that I would say is maybe properly what it primarily is, but there is a concern with virtue behind all this, and it's not that the Wealth of Nations offers a book of virtues and a guide to virtue, but it does offer um, some guidance on how to understand your own mer merit and praiseworthiness and virtue that you were saying um, in this kind of system. Yeah, I, I see your paper as a, um, <clears throat> as a cultural landmark, an attempt to put down a, a flag, a, um, a banner of that this is the way we ought to think about our working, the working side of our lives, that, that there's a virtue to work itself, right? That matters, that how we see, how we spend that six to 12 hours <laughs> a day, depending on what kind of job you have. Uh, should we be proud of it? Should we be ashamed of it? Should we expand it? Should we take the job that pays the most money? Should we be ashamed of a job that pays right. a lot? Right, right. Yeah, that's an important – those issues are an important part of the liberal civilization that Smith advanced and helped to create. And so this ethical side, virtue side of the whole, you know, concern and, if you like, um, movement – I don't know what the right word is – um, you know, effort to bolster and maintain liberal civilization has to deal with this, um, the, 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 the ethical conditions that it provides for and, and some guidance uh, to people in general about uh, how to understand the ethics of their participation in the whole system. And in some sense, you're pushing back against the people who push back against that commercial humanism. Yeah, of I'm course. I'm thinking of Wordsworth's Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying that's not so. Um, you're saying that getting and spending are, should be done virtuously. They can be done in ways that are not virtuous, but there's no reason they can't be done virtuously. Yes, and furthermore, that there should be a sort of presumption to honest income serving the good of the whole. So it's not only that it's innocent – that it even ought to have a sort of presumptive a presumption of praiseworthiness. Not it's not an iron clay. It's just like the presumption of innocence. It's not that it's never overturned. I mean, some people are guilty, but it, the presumption puts the burden of proof on the prosecution. Uh, so, so I think I think Adam Smith really is helping to build a presumption in favor of honest income. That's not to say that people who don't make more honest income. I have something wrong with them or it's a failure or something like that. It's just that it's completely wrongheaded to see, you know, to kind of presume wrongdoing or evil in a person being wealthier. And on the contrary, you know, uh, until you look further into it, and it, again, all of this revolves around knowledge problems, um, you actually ought to assume something more like the reverse, that it reflects some good that they've done. Explain what you mean by revolves around knowledge problems. Well, that's the thing. I mean, whereas commutative justice is quite precise and accurate, and we have a pretty clear sense and can communicate pretty clearly when we've had our stuff messed with or when we think that Jim has messed with someone else's stuff, like here, look at the smash window. Hey, look, you know, this, you know, my porch furniture is now missing. Um, or what have you. Jim is a stand-in for a 
uh, an average person. Yeah. Not, not a particular Jim you have in mind. That's correct. James. Just sort Jim, of our yeah. fellow Jim. Yeah. Okay. Um, whether Jim is making a becoming use of his own is like a so much more delicate question because, first of all, we don't have a great sense of even what his own is here because it has to do with his own capabilities, his own interests, his own inclinations, his own potentialities. Um, and, you know, any issue, any kind of ethical issue is always compared to what. And so it's always like, okay, what is it that, like, suppose Jim, you know, goes out and makes more honest income somehow, um, or shows, spends extra effort at work, longer hours at the job. So what exactly is the alternative for Jim? And so how do we assess, you know, which one's better if we don't even know what the other one is? Because, again, it's very private and personal and fleeting often. So, and he, Jim himself may not be able to articulate exactly what his, you know, option B was. So I'm just, so, so there's a very serious knowledge problems in second guessing um, people's ethical choices. Um, so that's one way that we have knowledge problems as, as people who might want to, you know, how dare you? <laughs> um, of course, knowledge problems are, are, are also super important in trying to be benevolent and trying to serve the good of the whole directly uh, in some more conscious or intended way. And there, you know, Adam Smith taught the very important point that when we get much beyond the local, our knowledge declines so much that our benevolence is not as effective. That it's not effective to try to help people you don't know anything about. And this leads to, this leads to you know, kind of some paradoxes. You might say, okay, so fine, you know, go learn about those charities and get to know those people. And to really get a good relational knowledge, you would actually want to develop a relationship, some relationships with people. And that's all to the good, and I'd advocate that. But the paradox here is that in a way, now that you've sort of befriended people in trying to help them, you're in a way back to helping your friends, which is, again, in a sense, now your local community, your local interests in a way. So there's all these – there's huge knowledge problems in ways to serve the good of the whole. Market prices and the price system – are signals to serving that. And the thing is, everything else is also signals. And if you want to say there's all sorts of market failures and problems and fallibilities in the market signals, yeah, you know, there's all sorts of problems and failures and fallibilities in the non-market signals. You listen to your friend, you listen to your echo chamber, you know, group think, misrepresentation, you know, good PR, marketing, pulling on people's heartstrings, whatever, 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 friends, partiality. So we are stuck with having to deal with imperfect signals and the imperfect signals of the market that Hayek taught us about as a communication system have to be compared with imperfect signals that we otherwise would have to rely on. So either way, we have knowledge problems. So I've, I want to say a few things about that or try to um... – First, I want to make it clear that what you're suggesting when you're saying that prices are a signal that wages, things that pay more than other things, have a certain presumption of being more valuable, meaning people are willing to pay more for them. And I think that's problematic, but it's not a bad place to start because the alternative, as you point out, is, is very challenging. Um, we're going to talk more about that uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, second thing is I want to broaden your point about the knowledge problem. So – and bring in something, you, the point you make in the paper, that it's not just that I know more about the people near me. I care more about them. Um, I, I have a better way to assess whether I'm actually helping them or not because I, I care. And I can't care a lot about people who are far away. And I don't just mean physically far away. I mean emotionally far away or that I don't have good knowledge about. So it's not just that uh, there's a knowledge problem. There's a skin in the game, an incentives problem that – I, I probably don't spend my money so carefully on strangers as I spend it on my friends, as I spend it on myself. And and I think that's that's important. And it and it reminds me of an email I've I've gotten maybe twice as host where people say, you know, I really 
I really believe in liberty and I'd, I'd like to make the world a better place. What should I do? And of course, I can't answer that question. I've, I've talked about this on the air maybe once before. Um, you know, d should that person become a fabulous entrepreneur, raise a lot of money and create a think tank that advocates for what, what I might call good policy? Should that person uh, get a PhD in economics uh, and become an advocate? Uh, should they uh, raise a family and, and be kind to other people? I mean, it's just there, there's – yeah. Be, be, a, be an exemplar, which, uh, so, I, you know, all three are good, but. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what, a, I don't know what the becoming use of his yeah. own is. And, and part of being a grown up, I think, and being a, a responsible, mature, ethical adult is figuring out that. Um, and of course, we grope toward it. It's not a, I recently read a wonderful essay uh, by Paul Graham that he gave. Uh, it's a mock high school graduation speech. I, th I think he said he never gave it. When they found out more about him, they revoked his invitation. But it's a wonderful speech. And I, I shared shared it with some of my children, uh, the younger ones, but and I might share with all of them when I, now that I think about it, because it says things like, probably not a good idea to have a plan <laughs> and, and, and a goal, because you don't know enough to have a goal. So if you just think, you know, we're thinking about uh, it reminds me when a reporter once asked me, I mean, you're against giving money to help people in Africa have better schools? I said, we can't even figure out how to spend money to have better schools here in the United States. Why would I think, why would I presume that I could help them? I'm, in fact, I'd hurt them. That That's the worst, that's the real problem. So the idea that you have a knowledge problem about yourself is, is it's not just how do I help people other than myself or strangers mm -hmm. or not close friends. How do I help myself? How do I figure out how to proceed with my life. And, and Graham, Paul Graham's point, been on Econ Talk, we didn't talk about this, but I don't think, uh, his point is that is that you don't know enough to know what you should try to be. And some of the things you'd like to be don't exist now when you'll be capable in 10 years. So I just think that's really, yeah. really, I'll let you react to that if you want, and then I want to, I want to give you another example. Uh, no, that all makes perfect sense. It just shows how extreme the knowledge problem is. Um, like, like Jim wouldn't even know for sure himself uh, what his option B is, and again, how he would understand his being becoming, um, and and you feel your way through life. Uh, so we shouldn't be quick to judge people. Um, um, but again, you know, pursuing honest income is uh, has some things to be said for it, and you know, yeah, no, I don't have it. So here's an example I used to talk about when I used to teach micro, or as I called it, price theory. Um, so at the end of his life, Friedrich Gauss, one of the, I think, inarguably one of the five greatest mathematicians and of all time, maybe one of the great minds of all time, he, the, the normal distribution is, is the Gaussian distribution. That's just one little thing he figured out. Um, you know, I think when he died, he left a notebook of 16 pages that kept people busy for you know, maybe a century or two. He's just a really deep, deep thinker. And at the end of his life, I am told or was told by a philosophy professor, I think, he really got into surveying, um, figuring out how far away things were from other things, designing maps. And, you know, and, and you could look at that and say, well, that's that's a terrible waste. Why should he be a surveyor? And just to take it to an extreme he may have been a really important surveyor and maybe he actually, I, was, I suspect it wasn't a trivial thing. Let's say he was a gardener. Yeah. Uh, people, people resent, I've heard people speak resentfully that Newton, you know, was into the music of the spheres, uh, you know, what noise, what, what, what harmonies, what, what, what gorgeous music did the spheres make in the heavens when they, when they rotated. It's the way he saw the universe at some dimension. It's like, well, who, who are you to tell me tell Newton what he spent yeah. his time on? But you know, there's a certain natural reaction to that 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 was not a becoming use of one's own. He could have done more for the whole if he had done something else. Adam Smith, he might say, some people might say, unfortunately, uh, took that job at the Customs Commission in 1778, two years after you know the great second book came out. He took a job which really did occupy a lot of his time for the remaining years of his life. It may like, be what the heck. Yeah, it may have been one thing that prevented him from completing the jurisprudence work that he had announced in 1759. Um, so was that an unbecoming use of Adam Smith's own? Um, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to defend him. 
uh, well, not so much Smith, but Gauss and and, and others. Um, you know, I'd include in this uh, Michael Jordan playing baseball for a couple of years and depriving the world of his greatness on the basketball court. Um, the point you make in your essay is that, well, the the joy that they got from gardening or baseball or surveying or you know, the music of the spheres, that counts. That's part of the whole. You can't. You and, yeah, and furthermore, that we have to manage. When we talk about ourselves as the one who's becoming and the one who is virtuous, it's kind of like, like Russ the soul, you know, or like for me, Dan the soul, that is kind of managing Dan the creature, <laughs> Dan the presentist self. We're very, very presentist. And that's just like, a, in a sense, a whole bunch of constraints, uh, as well as possibilities and potentialities on, um, you know, the person. And, you know, you have to have your delights. You have to, you want to keep the program. If you don't have, if you don't feed the presentist self enough, you kind of lose spirit. You lose will in the whole program. And you lose, you might also lose, rec, you know, kind of insight and the kind of joy and pride and pleasure that makes you see better ways to serve the whole, to update your goal or your plan, just like you were saying. And so maybe, you know, gardening was a way and pondering the music of the atmosphere of the heavens was ways of, you know, being tacitly creative and taking this recreation or Sabbath and keeping the whole program as good as it could be. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's a tempting uh, way to look at it. Um, when you say presentist, do you mean you mean sort of my material, immediate self? What do you, what do yeah, you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, very, very sort of like immediate. Um, even if it's. A, an immediate reflection of an anticipated future, kind of like to to, to be like my immediate sentiment um, and and condition in a way. Um, I don't think of it as strictly material. Um, like if someone insults me or you know something, that can also be part of a passionate immediate presentist self problem <laughs> like emotions and resentments and insults and what have you um eagerness you know lust whatever um so i'm not but but we're we're very presentist you know movie was very good on this was the movie 7 i don't know if you remember that with Brad Pitt and um I don't see that and i think Kevin Spacey's the bad guy um it's about seven sins um, and, and one of them is vengeance, I think, right? So, like, I, th I think it was about sort of the sin of um, this presentist urge to vengeance. Um, but we're sort of, you know, uh, and, and it kind of fits this whole thing with my essay because we have to learn to manage what we deal with in the present and to make those passions and those interests better rather than worse. So I, I quote La Rochefoucauld, who says, virtues are swallowed up by self-interest as rivers are lost in the sea. And what he's getting at there is that no matter how virtuous the inspiration or benevolent the inspiration might be for something, the program and project sort of needs to be turned into things that are more presentist interest, like, like a structure of interests and in, even incentives for oneself to execute, to carry out, to make focal this beneficial project. And so what might be virtue inspired kind of gets lost in self-interest in a way. Oh, like Russ. Oh, well, he's like really into his fame of being the econ talk rock star, right? And getting a lot of notoriety and getting that, oh, yeah. getting that darned recording <laughs> done and getting done and being able to go home at the end before rush hour, getting rid of Klein. I mean, you know, there's a self-interest side that all of this gets turned into as rivers are lost in the sea. And so in a way... It's like virtue is more about what it is that we turn into our interests 
then it's about seeing past our self-interest to, towards like the social good, like some kind of divide between our self-interest and the social good. No, it's like virtue is more about like what it is we make our self-interest. And similarly with the presentist management of ourself. So we have to get the right passion. We have to like develop the right presentist passions. Yeah, I, I, I can't help but note the um, the nature of the word becoming, which is by definition dynamic. It, 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 it evokes potentiality to be realized. Exactly. The process by which one uh, becomes virtuous. I, I want to come back to... You, you alluded to, and I got the illusion because it's in your essay, but for listeners who haven't read the essay yet, of course, we'll link to it. Um, recreation, uh, of which gardening would be an example. You use the example of going to a sporting event, which on a certain level, one could argue is an enormous waste of, of one's own, one's own time, one's own focus. Um, it's a zero-sum game, a sporting event. <laughs> Uh, that's the crude way to to characterize. It's also a ballet and a, a drama to be uh, written that hasn't been scripted and therefore mm-hmm. is delightful to the eye and and to the ear. But um, this idea that that obviously you shouldn't go to a sporting event, one might argue, because it's a waste of time. One shouldn't go, and I don't just mean wrestling, a wrestling match, but even a, a great basketball game or other. Well, sport that's beautiful. Uh, and you could argue that dance, of course, is a waste of time. You could argue that listening to music is a waste of time. You could argue that, as as some philosophers have, that throwing a birthday party for your young child is a waste of your money. It's an, un, an, an, an unethical use of your own because there are people dying who you could save. There are Bed nets to be bought to fight malaria. There are there's deworming to be paid for, and many people argue on a utilitarian grounds that is not, I would say, inconsistent with the good of the whole argument that you're making. That all those things a, a thoughtful, virtuous person should not do, and you're suggesting. Uh, I think there's a lot to say about that, obviously, but one of the things you're suggesting is that by indulging or what appears to be an indulgence, you're actually enhancing the program. But that's, of course, a very utilitarian argument. I'd also argue that if all you do is serve others, you're a different kind of slave. Um, would you work, as this gets back to your point about about turning your virtues into self-interest, if, if, if you gave all your, almost all your money away on the grounds that there are people who need it more than you do, could you work as hard as you do? Could you be as productive? Maybe you should be, but could you be? Yeah, right. Could you keep up the program? Um, or is that just an excuse for my own indulgences? Well, that's the thing. It's not It's not like I'm excusing all of the football games that people go and pay for t- uh, to go see. I'm not. It's not about excusing everything. It's just that... It, it's up for it's you know each person has to wrestle with this themselves and they've got their own things and again i'm not especially i'm not concerned in the essay actually with what you do with the income once you've it's come in it's more about the um pursuing of greater honest income um but but yeah no those are those are all those are all good questions um if you take your honest income and you give it all to charity, like you suggested. That certainly could be becoming. I hope there are good there are good choices you make in giving to charities. Um, I just want to say that you know, investing it in plastics, like our character from the movie that I reference, and and earning let's say fifteen percent. There's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said for that. Perhaps being more beneficial, even. Uh, not always. I'm not making a categorical claim, but there's 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 a reasonable claim there. So let's set that up. It's a reference to the movie Sabrina, which uh, I think I've actually referenced on this program at some point. It's the maybe one of it, it's kind of the only scene in a movie, uh, an American movie I can think of, where the virtues of capitalism are captured in uh, about thirty seconds, which is quite an achievement. Um, 
and just to say, I'll let you read the quote, but it's uh, it's William Holden is a, a ne'er do well um, Playboy brother of um, Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart runs the family business. His younger brother's a, a hedonist. I would describe him. He likes wine, women, and song. He doesn't work. He lives off the family money. It's a classic character in popular culture. And Humphrey Bogart's the doer, uh, responsible, and capitalist, very profit-motivated uh, tycoon, um, wealthy, uh, striving, and so on. And they have a uh, – there's a this very short interaction they have in the movie that is, you know, is an economist who cares about prosperity and 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 – uh, markets. I've you know this is this is an exhilarating moment for me. I think it's not in the remake. I'm pretty sure they cut this. I didn't see this, the remake. I, I saw the remake. Um, the I, I'm pretty Harrison sure it's not Ford. in Harrison Ford and uh, Greg uh, whatever, and I forget who the the, the Sabrina is. Uh, Audrey Hepburn in the original, but um, re- tell us. Tell us that scene. Sure. So Humphrey Bogart, like Russ is saying, is one of the brothers. He's the older brother who's sort of the reliable brother to take and, and run the family business. Uh, he's very focused. So he's very much this kind of guy pursuing honest income. And Linus is his brother, played by William Holden, the playboy type. And uh, he says um, that to his older brother, Humphrey Bogart, he says, I don't get it. Why do you work so hard? Why are you so focused on this? You've got all the money in the world. And then Humphrey Bogart replies, well, what's money got to do with it? If making money were all there was to business, it'd hardly be worthwhile going to the office. Money is a byproduct. And then William Holden replies, well, then, what's the urge? You're going into plastics now. What will that prove? Prove nothing much. A new product has been found, something of use to the world, so a new industry moves into an undeveloped area. Factories go up, machines are brought in, a harbor is dug, and you're in business. It's purely coincidental, of course, that people who never saw a dime before suddenly have a dollar, and barefooted kids wear shoes and have their teeth fixed and their faces washed. What's wrong with that kind of, uh, with the kind of, an urge that gives people libraries, hospitals, baseball diamonds, and movies on a Saturday night. (laughs) So that's Bogart's answer, um, which um, there's a a deadpan joke in there, right? Which is, what does he say? It's not, it's just a coincidence. Is that what he said, how he phrases it? Um, It's just a coincidence that people who never saw a dime now see a dollar. That's sarcastic. He doesn't mean it's just a coincidence. He means it's a natural byproduct. Right. And he enjoys, when he has the time to reflect on it. Exactly. His becoming use of his own. So I use him as like an example of a child of the commercial humanism. Like he actually... Feels virtuous Bogart. and under yes, the older brother. Yes, yes. Bogart as an example because he he's doing good and he's got an appreciation for the good he's doing and he's I think he's more or less sincere when he says you know if making money was all there was to business it'd hardly be worthwhile going to the office. Now when he says money is a by a byproduct. That I don't <laughs> completely agree with because it's yeah. it's 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 an essential part of the mechanics, the mechanisms, the signals, and his money and gains in a way are a way of his keeping score, not in keeping up with the Joneses or anything like that, but or his like, ego, it's yeah, or anything like that, but actually a way of keeping score in a way of like how much he's serving universal benevolence. Not that it's like a direct measure of like some unit of well-being, but just kind of like the bigger it is, the more he has helped the good of the whole. Um, Yeah, I don't know where you want to go, but I'm interested in talking about the parable. I'm going to get to that. Don't worry, Dan. We're going to get to the parable. I want to first talk about the um, invisible hand, which – as you know more than I think probably anybody in the world is used once in the theory of moral sentiments and once in uh, the wealth of nations, the phrase. And when it is used in the theory of moral sentiments, 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he is, um, actually, I'm going to back it up. I'm going to talk about the first parable we're going to talk about, then we'll get to the second one, which is the invisible one. So the first parable Smith talks about is the poor man's son, and now it could be the poor man's poor woman's daughter, but that the person who's raised in poverty and looks across the river and sees the great mansion and aspires to material well-being, uh, or the wealthy person who has a massive estate with ever more gardens and ever more machinery at, at, at his disposal, Smith says, you know, if you look to that ambition, if you look to that desire to have more wealth and that poor man's son, says Smith, who works hard over his lifetime and eventually attains material success, Smith says, you know, not going to make him much happier. Maybe less happy, actually, because he's going to be under the pressure of business and the operos machines or machinery that, that he's become entangled with in this quest for wealth. And he says, mm-hmm. really, well, I always say it, it's kind of a fool's game, the, 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 that ambition. And then, and that's a lovely thought that, that money for its own sake is, is not going to do it. But then he has this strange passage, which you quote, which I'm a little troubled by, and we're going to use this to lead into the second parable, which we'll get to. But here's a strange passage where he says, yeah, so ambition's kind of stupid, doesn't really pay off, uh, leads to often to misery and, and disappointment. You're going to find out you're no happier with uh, that really great pocket watch that tells great time or your really good gadget that's even cooler and hipper than the one you have now. But it's a good thing that that's there because this – we're guided as if by an invisible hand to create employment for people and you could say we're going to create the dime, the dollar for that poor person who used to only have a dime, the shoes that the poor person's child can fix. So which is it? I mean, material prosperity is glorious in certain dimensions. It lets us live long and enjoy life. And yet Smith says, eh, it's not so great. You're fooled to think that you should be striving after it. And then he basically says, yeah, but without that urge, civilization wouldn't exist. Which, by the way, is a, an exact statement, um, a, a parallel statement to a statement in the Talmud that says this this evil inclination, as, as the rabbis call it, this inclination to, for greed and, and acquisition and and that we're not satiated. He says, boy, without that, he's, the rabbis say we wouldn't have children, we wouldn't create cities, we'd, have, we'd be living in caves and loincloths. So what's Smith saying here? Where, where's he come down on this? Right. That's the big question. And I think the the passage just provokes just that thought. And it's very paradoxical because um, Smith does exoterically present it as um, the as the guy, the poor the son of the poor man who through ambition rises to wealth. Um, and then looks back in his old age and feels like it was sort of not worth it, um, that this was beneficial, just as you say. It also creates new goods and new markets and innovations. The great enrichment is, I think, what Smith is getting at. But go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm probably oh, sure. interrupting. I'm going to quote. I should have quoted. It. He says, it's, that, it's this deception of, yes. of that that money will make us happy. This deception, which, quote, first prompted them to cultivate the ground, to build houses, to found cities and commonwealths, to invent and improve all the sciences and arts, which ennoble and embellish human life, which have entirely changed the whole face of the earth, have turned the rude forests of nature into agreeable and fertile plains, and made the trackless and barren ocean a new found of subsistence and the great high road of communication to the different nations of the earth. Yeah. So the earth by these labors of mankind has been obliged to redouble yeah. her natural fertility and maintain a greater multitude of inhabitants. So it's not only that civilization got created, but more people can enjoy it. And yeah. wait a minute, I thought it was all just a fool's game. So this, <laughs> yeah. And this, a way to put this paradox is, okay, so you've got this, let's call him Jim again, the son of the poor man's son, who goes through this, enters this from ambition, looking to become a mark of distinction, looking to be with, among the filthy rich, and and succeeds, and then is unhappy in, at the end of his life. But Smith points out that in the meanwhile, he's done all the things or helped to bring about all the things you just read. Did Jim pursue his career? Was that distributively just? And I think Smith would have to say no, because because purpose um, and intention matter a lot to justice and virtue. 
It's not enough that benefits flowed from what Jim did. It's virtue requires more than that. It also requires stuff on the ben, the the intention side. And so that's why I think Smith's parable suggests further thought and another parable, which I'd like to talk about. Yeah. Lay and, it so, out. and so this is this is kind I'm of gonna, a, I disagree with you on that, but we'll go baby. I'll okay, get to let it. me go let ahead. me no, off, keep, off, look go, forward. Go, go. So Smith's parable, which we see on the page, you could call the visible parable. And I believe that it suggests a, an invisible parable. In the invisible parable, which I present in my paper, so I make it visible in my paper, um, it's about a young person now, yes, admiring the rich, but also certain others. Maybe this person has been, let's call him Jim again, a new Jim, has been listening to econ talk. Um, and he goes to the library, and he goes to the Liberty Fund website, and he learns some things. He reads Smith. He reads Russ's book on how Adam Smith can change your life and so on. Anyway, he learns he learns that garnering 15% in plastics means that barefooted kids now wear shoes. He learns all this. And he can now kind of go into investing and pursuing honest income, however it is, you know, labor, whatever, um, with with this kind of appreciation and something on the intention side and spirit side, which now makes it distributively just, which makes it more becoming. Now, that I I that's to me the invisible parallel. I'm I'm sorry, the invisible parable that Smith's cult, so Smith is actually part of this parable because he writes the books that this Jim now reads. J- Smith kind of teaches us that commercial humanism that Poc- as Pocock called it, and we got we've got now people like Linus Larrabee in the uh, Sabrina movie who pursue commerce and honest profit in a more virtuous mode and maybe even more effectively um, by virtue of all this. So that, to me, is the invisible parable. And it does still pose challenges and questions because is this really sustainable? How do we really know that someone has this more virtuous spirit in in sort of doing private enterprise? Um, it's not, again, it's a knowledge problem. So I'm not saying it like resolves things neatly at all. We we'll always have to look into what's in our soul. You know, who knows what lurks, like the, the shadow knows, only the shadow knows what lurks in the hearts of men. But that's what you have to do with your own heart. Um, but it's good to appreciate that, and people do come to learn that their hard work, their entrepreneurship their inventiveness and so on does mean that barefooted kids now wear shoes and they can pursue commerce and everything else uh, with that in mind and and I think more virtuously. So some would say, occasionally it crosses even my mind, that that's all sounds good, but isn't that just an excuse for exploiting people, for doing harmful things that earn people a lot of money, gain monopoly power, even rent-seeking if you're not careful. Once you enshrine in some Randian way, which I would say is the extreme version of this, Ayn Rand's vision, once you enshrine money as virtuous, which is what you're implying, you excuse all kinds of really rapacious and ugly things. Yeah, it totally— And Smith wouldn't like that, Dan. It, it— I agree. I agree. But, you know, that's the way the world is, that um, things can be misused and abused. Uh, This um, line that I'm offering, this kind of invisible hand uh, line of thinking can be used to justify, to defend uh, different kinds of profitable practices that are unethical, that are not becoming. And again, how do we it's it's got to do with knowledge problems it's not that anything makes money is therefore praiseworthy is therefore distributively just it's a presumptive it's a presumption 
And, you know, overcoming that presumption requires knowledge about how this particular case was unethical, was abusive or exploitative. Um, and that's that, that, you know, so it's hard. Um, but that's the way the world is. And this and we have to work with presumptions to structure just to how we go about in the world, how we treat people, what things, you know, are permitted and attitudes and encouragement and everything else. And it's going to be this presumption or that presumption. And so get used to it. Before going on, I want to mention that uh, there's a website, 80,000hours.org, that tries to help people find out ways that they can use their time to make the world a better place, usually in explicit ways, as opposed to these implicit 15% of um, plastics. Um, So you might... If you're interested in these questions, you you might profit from going to that web page. Um, the thing that bothers me about this, oh, let me say first what I like about it and then what bothers me. So I like the idea and I want to believe that productive people make more money than unproductive people. And there's a certain sense in which that's true. And when you say productive, you mean advancing the good of the whole people. Yeah, so let's uh, – that phrase, I just I love that phrase because it's vague, um, and it and it's clever if you not not specify it more precisely. Um, one way to defend it, I guess, would be to say I know it when I see it, um, and I know it when it's not true. Um, of course, people differ a great deal on on that, and and often see. Um, I, I can't. Have, I'm thinking today, right this moment, of you know, payday lenders people who charge high rates of interest to people. Um, is that a, is that a, uh, it's very profitable, right? Of course, one reason it's profitable is that this might be a high default rate. The other reason it's profitable is that maybe society looks down on it. And so to get involved in it, you have to earn a reasonable amount of money to, to justify uh, getting into that business. So it, it gets complicated very quickly. But I, I, I want to believe that, that wages signal something about virtue. Uh, And part of me wants to believe that as a counterpoint to the cultural disdain for wages and profit. Part of me wants to believe that because I make a good living and I like to feel good about myself. And part of it is because I think it might be true that that the, um, you know, Nozick talks about this in Anarchy State and Topia where, you know, a great basketball player is entertaining more people, a great basketball player than, than a school teacher. Uh, a mediocre school teacher for sure. Uh, a great basketball player today entertains more people than a great basketball player of 1960 or 1970. So it's there's a justness to the fact that the wage of a basketball player today is higher than it used to be. At the same time, that's a little troubling. Um, do I really want to use the scarcity of talent? Uh, as a, which is part of the wage. It's not just the value or demand for the talent. It's also the scarcity of it. Is that really, you know, is there really anything meritorious there? Probably not. Um, there's hard work, but, you know, that's part of nature and nurture. Also, that's a longer uh, side that we'll, let's, let's not get into. But my point is that I, I want to believe those things, and, and I'm constantly remembering the caveats and the, the confounding parts that you – point out in the paper and passing, I would argue, not at the center. You, you say, um, uh, you say there's a, I think you say there's a, um, you say sometimes the making of an additional honest dollar is unbecoming. Sometimes there is honest profit in serving folly, whether it be pernicious substances or pernicious art and discourse. Sometimes real externalities appertain. Sometimes the advantage can be had by the less worthy competitor. Sometimes making less is becoming because chiseling is opportunistic or because a dollar means less to a rich person than it does to a poor person or because charging less means that more will enjoy a service with non-rivalrous benefits or very low marginal costs. So those are – that's a very nice summary of the of the footnotes. Is it just a footnote? Does that change the presumption that honest income is, is virtuous? Um, Again, you know, there's a flavor to the comment you just made where, you know, you you kind of put it as that like the wage or the income reflects virtue. That's not exactly what I want to suggest. Um, it's a little stronger than what I want to suggest. The Remember, the justness is not so much 
that things are somehow adjusted to a proper pattern or an ideal pattern, say, of like compensations and rewards in, lo- in line with some kind of pattern of contributions. It's not, the justness is more like Jim deciding justly his own action in choosing course A over course B. Um, and so these, these issues about, you know, the basketball player today versus the basketball player in 1960, um, I think of it more as like Wilt Chamberlain, like d- does he make a just decision in his own world given his own options to pursue a, a higher income? And that's that's the kind of decision I want to suggest that um, the presu- a presumption. It's not so much that I want to say, yeah, if I'm giving Wilt advice, I'm going to tell him you should pursue the higher income. I mean, maybe that is what I would tell him if I knew nothing else. It's more that I want to really push back against the people who dis high income, dis the pursuit of honest income, dis the pursuit of um, acquis- you know, acquisitiveness, if you like, a- and even like kind of regard wealth and the rich as somehow um, indicative of wrongdoing, you know, like ill-gotten gains. Uh, I really want to push back against that. I, I, really, I really don't in any way want to send out any kind of message about if you're not earning much high income, much income, you're, you're kind of failing on the virtue barometer. Um, that's really not the thrust of it at all. Uh, is, does that help? Well, I, I think it, <clears throat> I, I didn't mean it that way, but that's mm-hmm. one way to sharpen what I was saying, I guess. Um, let's take you and me. I went into economics because I was good at it and I loved it. I didn't think anything more about it than that. Um, I found it entertaining and intellectually stimulating. And when I got out of graduate school in 1980, I was earning a little under $19,000 a year, which I think at that time was a little below the median. I'm not 100. I haven't checked that lately. I think it was. Now I make much more than the median. I've been lucky. Um, the internet came along, which made things like Econ Talk possible, expanded my reach, mm-hmm. Um made it easier for a foundation like Liberty Fund to support EconTalk and the Hoover Institution to hire me to be part of that. Um, So I've been blessed. um, And I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything particularly virtuous necessarily about that I make a lot more than the median income. It does does capture something about what I do. um, But I don't think it makes me better than my... um, I don't want to think it makes me better than the than the woman who is the head of the crew that cleans my house for a hundred dollars for four people in an hour. Um, I, I make more than that. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. That I don't really mean it to be like a meter of virtue. It's more about just you're choosing something, and, and one of your options means higher income. Um, that there's something to be said for that in your choice to choose that option over your other option. It's not about your virtue versus the other person's virtue. Yeah, that's a great point. But the other point would be then, so let's say I could have been, when I was in graduate school, the thing that that most horrified me, and I apologize to anyone I'm offending right now, would be, would be to be the chief economist at uh, Ford Motor, which was a job that you know, a PhD in economics could do. Um, we disdained that uh, for no good reason. Uh, we could have given a reason, but for no good reason. But part of the reason I think we disdained it, interestingly, is it paid really well. Uh, one of the reasons it paid really well is it to get you to give up the relatively pleasant life of being <laughs> uh, an academic. You had to compensate a person to take that job. Um, I don't think there's anything virtuous about being the head of Ford Motor, even though it pays more than a professor, starting professor when I came out of grad school. And then I start to wonder, well, my whole calculus, maybe it's a little bit warped, you know, my defense of these signals and wages and prices make you uneasy at all? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, you and I were probably alike and probably a lot of people listening to this similarly. 
are interested in trying to um, participate in discourse and serve the public good in some way, that way, um, then you can cash that out in each of our individual cases as certain forms of uh, self-interest that that gets kind of turned into, again, as rivers are lost in the sea. Um, And so it's not always just higher income that... um, calls to uh, that that appeals to us and we also understand that um there's other ways uh, to advance the good of the whole okay and we we obviously disagree with that in terms of the kind of discourse we put out because sometimes we disagree with each other uh not so much you and me russ but um you know generally speaking uh people in kind of a discourse life um about politics and policy especially um yeah, we, we could discover late in life or never that our whole life as intellectual enterprise was a was a brutal mistake. Uh, unintended had unintended consequences that we couldn't see, didn't know, and were should be ashamed of. Yeah, I don't know that any, either of us could ever hope to have <laughs> that much consequence in anything we say. No, but our team. You know, that team, we aligned so ourselves speak. with and that yes. we made our small contribution. Yes, whatever. yes, yes, that's that's true. I mean, you could spin out uh, theories like that way that um, are not totally ridiculous or not totally uh, illogical um, about, you know, prosperity and wealth and innovation and technology ultimately arriving at just widespread capability for people to irresponsibly use destructive technologies, say, or um, other other scenarios you could imagine. You, but you're stuck with those kind of tough options, any which way you turn. Yeah, I love your point. And I, you know, I think the thing I'll probably take away from this conversation that I found most profound is this idea that it's so trivial, Dan, actually, this insight, and yet it's so hard to remember, which is that it's complicated, and, and we don't like complicated. I, yeah. Just tell me the answer, okay? Is it good to make a lot of right. money or is it not? And the answer is it's complicated. Right. But it's complicated, meaning it's not shameful by right. in and of itself, and that part is part of your message. It is, um, and this relates to one other caveat in the paper, which is that just the person himself, the gym pursuing honest income can make a vice of acquisitiveness. It can become cupidity. It can become too single minded. And even if he does put, you know, help more barefooted children to then wear shoes, it still can be too much in certain ways in his private life and his word in his world. I'm sorry. Um, and so, and so you have this, um, Problem just on that side, too. Uh, you know, it's not like, gee, what you should do is uh, just, you know, make sure that you're making more honest income the most you can. That's your best way to be virtuous. I don't I don't want to send that message either. And so we never really know why someone's and how virtuously someone is pursuing honest income. And whether it's in that spirit of the commercial humanism like Linus Larrabee or whether it's someone rationalizing, apologizing, right? Justifying illegitimately, actually some, uh, maybe some undue narrowness, focus, greed, and what have you. I just like to say that in this we never know point, that that's kind of one of the things about my title. Is it, one way to read it is, is it just to pursue honest income? Another is, is it just to pursue honest income? Is it just to pursue honest income? Like, is that's it? That's is, the whole thing. That's like, <laughs> is 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 what? Is it really? Is is Linus? Are Linus's efforts really just Linus pursuing income, or is it, you know, him doing it like partly in this mode and with an understanding that barefooted kids will now wear shoes? You see what I'm saying? Like, is it just to pursue honest? I don't know. Forget it. <laughs> No, but I, I think that's the – I mean, I wrote an essay a long time ago when you allude to the idea behind it in your paper, this um, question of the aftermath of a hurricane or some natural disaster. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of – you have an opportunity. Maybe you have a pickup truck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe you have some extra lumber. Maybe you have a generator. Maybe you have two free hands. 
should you head toward that disaster or away from it or ignore it? And I've always argued that, often argued, not always. Um, again, there is it's complicated, but that letting prices rise in the aftermath of that has this great virtue of, of signaling to people that they're needed. It encourages other people to step aside who might have already have a generator not to buy one at the store. Um, there are many things about high prices that virtues that we we often ignore. And part of what I've spent time doing in my book, The Price of Everything, and on here on Econ Talk is, is reminding people that it's it's more complicated than that. It's not just gouging. So it has a real um, powerful, extraordinary thing of 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 sending a signal in an imperfect world of a world of imperfect information and an imperfect world where people are not all that good. And so to get them to drive for four hours in their pickup truck and risk maybe even risk their life yeah. requires compensation and incentives. And and then I the point I made though I think it's more important perhaps is that it's not really relevant to talk about it's not meaningful. It's not precise to talk about what motivates them. Is it money or is it caring for others? Well, surely it could be both, can't it? Why can't a person who goes down to an, an area and and provides help feel good about it as well as making money? And I think that's the Larabee. Is Linus the playboy or the responsible? I can't remember. But Linus is Humphrey. Humphrey. So so he's he's rare. He actually feels notices that he's doing both. Maybe doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Probably spends more time thinking about how much. A, to put into plastics at 15% versus other things and but is aware because maybe he's Red Smith or, or you yeah. and and is aware that he's doing something virtuous and I, I actually don't care whether he's aware or not you know he's guided as if by an invisible hand he doesn't even know he's being guided uh, those signals of price and wages are pushing people in different ways and of course they're not all we respond to we care about non-monetary values as well you know we care about the satisfaction we get from the job not just the mon- amount it pays et cetera, et cetera. So it's more complicated just in that way. But the point is, is that, I mean, I just think that's an incredibly uh, valuable thing to remember, that it can be both. Yeah. And they're layered. I mean, it's, it's kind of wrong to say, is it this or that? The, mo- the different motivations you speak of, like one gives rise to the other. Um, you know, the impulse to be useful, to serve, to be involved or whatever, to have the approval of the man within the breast. How do you do that? How is that implemented? And it, you have to create practices, habits, you know, um, things that interests that then become, you know, self-interest. And money, earning money is part of the program of any enterprise, even if it's nonprofit enterprise, right? I mean, resources, you can't give away resources till you earn resources. Um, and so, you know, this this idea that it's this motive rather than that motive, oh, the guy's really just greedy. It's always layered. It's always layered. And so, like, again, I'd, I'd suggest that virtue is as much a matter of what it is we make our self-interest than it is sort of like going beyond our self-interest. Um, that's the second most important thing I think I learned in our, in this last conversation, the last part in our conversation. Um, I, I want to, it, it's risky, but I want to add one more thing. Um, this would have been a good place to stop. And for listeners, I usually look for a place around now to stop. And, um, but I, I want to get this example into the conversation that I, I may have mentioned it once in the history of econ talk. It's, um, it's a book I used to read to my children. It's called Henry Hikes to Fitchburg. Uh, Henry is um, Henry David Thoreau. Henry as a friend in in the in the book. It's a charming children's book that I used to use to make fun of it because it bothered me. Uh, but there's a part of me that likes this too. So I'm it's complicated. So Henry Henry and his friend are going to meet in Fitchburg. Uh, Henry walks. Uh, the book's called Henry Hikes to Fitchburg. Henry's friend decides not to walk. Henry's friend decides to earn money and take the train. Because why uh, walk? It's 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 days. Why not take the train? So in the intermediate, in the while Henry's hiking, and of course this is romanticized beyond words. Henry's picking blueberries and wading in a beautiful stream and observing the countryside and. In my version, I always add that he's getting stung by bees and he's, you know, 
<laughs> getting attacked by wolves so that my children don't over-romanticize nature, although I'm a big fan of it. Um, but anyway, Henry has this beautiful time getting to hit Fitchburg. His poor friend, slaves, cleaning somebody's cupboard out and painting and working and makes a dime here and a nickel there. And then he takes the train and he's the fool because he missed out on this great experience of hiking to, to Fitchburg rather than working like a dog. And, and it's a passage taken actually from Thoreau. Uh, it turned into this children's book. And, and I taught my children, I'm sure they've forgotten it, but I taught my children that Henry's friend didn't just forego the beauties of nature. He also helped serve the people in his community who needed their floor cleaned or their basement <laughs> refinished or whatever it is he yeah. did. Yeah. So the cleaning of the basement and understanding, you know, interacting some with the people there perhaps, but also just sort of having the spirit, if you like, of helping others and being proud of that. That's a little bit like the smelling of the flowers for Henry on his, on his walk. I mean, it might smell different, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting uh, way to apply these ideas. Yeah. But I think you know, as a parent and talking to parents out there in the audience, um, the question of whether we should, how much we should honor material success, material activity, our job versus our family and so on. And you, and you've, you mentioned it. It's obvious that a person who is a very successful entrepreneur and raises children who are damaged because they didn't mm -hmm. know their their mother or father is or he is, acted like a jerk because right. he was so absor ab absorbed right. yeah so so uh we understand that but but the point you're making today which I want to come back to and let you close on it is that it's important to remember what commercial life is really about and I've used this example before. It's from Naomi uh, Remen's book, My Grandfather's Blessings. This doctor who he's dying and some friend decides to bring together a group of people who've benefited from the device this doctor has had invented. And they're sitting around talking and each one stands up and thanks them for longer life and the things they've enjoyed about life. And he's sobbing. He's dying, but he's sobbing from joy because he says he never realized this. And I'm telling my sister this. My sister's a real estate agent. And she says, can you believe that he never, could it, he never thought about that? I said, well, how often do you think about the pleasure you bring to people, getting them into a house, which is scary and hard and frightening and fraught with challenges. And, and you help them make that decision. And you help them have a home, not just a house, a home. And she, she said, you know, I never thought about it. And how rarely we do think about what we actually accomplish in the ways that we work in the world. And I think it's, um, yeah. it's really important. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to just say, oh, I'm going to think about it. It's just not the same as the actual human interaction, um, the real sharing of sentiment of the real, you know, the person actually expressing it and so on. But yeah, that's, yeah, it's, we're, we're actually in, involved in many, many people's lives in a highly indirect way. Um, and we need good attitudes about it. Yeah. I guess the day has been Dan Klein. Dan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.